Good morning. Good afternoon. This is uh, Bloomberg uh, Risk and Rewards, which we do every Friday. It is Friday after a week. All of them seem very long and eventful. As John, you pointed out, John Authors here. I'm Lisa Abramowitz. And I think the theme really is heading into next week in the earnings season. U.S. companies are doing really well. I mean, we've spent weeks talking about recession and inflation and what's the Fed going to do and how is this going to be gloomy and doomy. But companies are still doing really well. And I'm wondering, John, do you believe that the Fed can really torpedo, torpedo that momentum with what they currently have planned? Um, eventually, yes. Uh, the Fed, if it really wants to, uh, to torpedo things, can do that. I think if QT goes far enough if they if they really um, flood the markets with uh, with bonds from their their balance sheets that should eventually find a point where they can where they can torpedo it if that's what they if that's what they want to do um, but there is something very strange um, about an environment um, I'm not when I'm looking on the terminal I'm normally looking to confirm something I suspect. Uh, and yesterday, I just looked at what was happening to earnings expectations for the year uh, and was astonished to see they'd gone up during the horrors of the first quarter and then thought, well, perhaps that always happened. So I then repeated the exercise for the nine previous years. And no, it doesn't. Great majority of times they fall, um, which is very, very surprising against the backdrop of everything everyone else is talking about. And if you look at European companies, so away from the Wall Street hype machine, they're actually doing even better, the uh, earnings momentum. I, I, I was, I will admit, very surprised. I asked, you know, it's not often I ask an innocent question of the terminal and get that by that surprised by the answer. Well, if you think about it, the base effects are coming in and we're still dealing with the recovery from the yes. pandemic. So there is the reopening trade. And yes, you know, airplane tickets are really expensive, but people are paying them and hotels expensive. People are paying them. People are going out to eat. So there is such a cash richness of the consumer, yes. at least in the United States, that it's really feeding out. And, and I'm looking toward earnings, JP Morgan kicking off on Wednesday, and I'm thinking, are companies really going to be able to keep passing along these price increases? And if they do, what does that mean in terms of how high inflation could get? Well, that's that's fascinating because I, I guess it plays to to another thing, which is that um, you tend to, or I, both of us probably tend to forget that inflation isn't all bad for everyone. Um, and it does historically tend to mean more pricing power. If, there's, if prices are generally rising more than usual, it's easier to sneak through a, uh, a price increase. It's easier to get away with shrinkflation, you know, re keep the same price, but have fewer candies in the in the in the packet or, or whatever. Um, so I can uh, I can see uh, a world where the, where um, companies do maintain, you know, do manage to, to continue growing despite uh, despite all the horrors, um, what still concerns me is uh, whether people are taking seriously enough the um, the, the outlook for rates. Because there's, you know, we normally talk a lot about the bond market. The bond market is uh, fairly clearly signalling something fairly bad is going to happen fairly soon, but then also suggesting things improve. It, it what bothers me is that the may almost have been a, a, an element of thinking too far ahead with the chess moves that uh, we're already convinced that that, that that the market is in this is already gone forward is assuming uh, that the Fed will get to a certain level and won't be able to carry on um, uh, or, or not making myself terribly clear here that the, the uh, I mean it's, it's almost like the Bill Dudley notion that uh, you know saying the Fed needs to effectively have a Fed call and really push down um, stocks and plainly there's there's some truth in that because we're implicitly still believing that there's a put that uh, if if if, uh, if the market throws a tantrum if the market throws a fit the Fed will be nice to it does that does that sorry uh, this is what happens when you become a parent you start thinking of the central <laughs> bank in terms of dealing with a toddler but uh, uh, do, do you um does that does that does that ring true for you apart apart from the parenting bit does that does, does that well yes that 
Yeah, and but I think that before you were know, taking even a step back, you were saying when we started before we actually got on air, you were saying it's uh you wonder whether we're thinking too many steps ahead, whether yes. you can just look at the momentum in companies and say things look pretty copacetic. Yes. You know, let's let's go full steam ahead. Let's invest. Where else are we going to get money at a time when inflation is running hot and you have bonds that are losing money at the fastest pace on record? So what are we doing here and why are we overthinking this? And I would argue that if you look at the pricing in equities, there's a lot of that sentiment bleeding through in valuations, not everywhere. Right. I mean, there have been pockets that have gotten blown out in particular in banks that have gone uh, down significantly, even as the yield curve or yield curve has flattened pretty much until the past couple of days. But, you know, just the fact that yields are going up as much as they are should help banks. Right. But there is this pessimism on the yeah. margins, but not wholesale yet. To your point, how tight do financial conditions mm -hmm. have to get to start to matter to slow inflation? Right. And that's what Bill Dudley was getting to. Yeah. Right now, they're not tightening yes. enough. And I think that people are looking at this and there is this fear. What if companies report incredible profits? The Fed looks at that and says, oh, my goodness, they're not seeing their margin squeeze. They can pass this along. Yeah. We better stop this because that means that we're going to see inflation get more entrenched in the psyche yes. of Americans. How much does that become? you know, the driving force behind an even more hawkish Fed. I mean, honestly, Jan Hatzius of Goldman Sachs on Bloomberg surveillance this morning yeah. was saying he could see a scenario where the benchmark Fed funds rate goes beyond 4% next year if they start to see uh, an ongoing increase in inflation and the same kind of labor market tightness that he sees currently, which he says is the most tight and most overheated going back to the 1950s. I mean, this is the scenario yeah. that's keeping people up at night. 4% before the end of next year from that was what he was saying from, I mean, from, but somebody is you know establishment as Jan Hatzius is quite something or you know Goldman's point of view will be is almost by definition very very influential on the rest of the on the rest of the street um well, and it echoes what Bill Dudley has said yes uh also you know uh, he died in the will Goldman person before he went to the the New York Fed I I, I mean I um I, I can very uncomfortably believe that the other, the other, you know, underlying that there is the uh, the concern about social unrest. Republicans are now almost as likely as Democrats to blame corporations for things, um, uh, and it, when things feel tough, people like to blame someone, um, which might. Be the corporate sector. Now, there would be, uh, you know, I'm not. There are certainly reasons why people might dislike certain things that the corporate sector is doing at present. I'm not absolving them of that. I, I, what What's concerning is whether that becomes a strong political current at a time when, as you know, as we were saying from the earnings results, the corporate sector is still doing quite nicely it's still providing an engine for growth that isn't likely to stop um inside it still doesn't look as though there's any great chance of it stopping inside the next 12 months um does that make i i i mean does does that does that make does that make sense in in in, in some way that, that that the the risk is almost more of political uh, civil unrest going forward, rather well, than um, rather rather than financial you know, rather than financial comeuppance. It goes together, right? I mean, that basically you've got inflation that changes the political uh, calculus to such a degree that you get a shift in in the conditions that affects mm. business, right? So it's it's yep. not the, it's not the crisis driven by the financial sector in the same direct kind of way. Uh, it's the circumstances leading to the Fed's actions that are leading to the, I mean, I'm thinking, and, and I'm talking around myself, just as like a, an actual example of what we're talking about, we've got the French election over the weekend. Yes. Marine Le Pen is actually, after trying to run a number of times, is actually in a competitive seat, is probably headed toward that runoff with yes. Emmanuel Macron on uh, April 24th. And there's this issue here, far right, very Trump-like, a lot of people have said, someone mm. who has gone to the countrysides and said, you know, I hear you, I see you, I see the rising costs, who doesn't like the EU as much as Emmanuel Macron, who does not embrace NATO's uh, establishment the same kind of way. Mm. 
what kind of risk does that present? And we've seen that kind of baked into the euro this week. And increasingly, yeah. as a potential downside scenario, and you see French yields rising uh, versus German yields mm -hmm. to the highest degree since the heart of the pandemic. I mean, these are all of the issues, to your yeah. point, really driven by mm -hmm. the backdrop of higher inflation. And frankly, you know, it's going to become more political and you're going to see more job owning and perhaps excess taxes mm -hmm. or whatever on energy profits. I mean, you could start to see how this percolates out into something that becomes a market risk through that social uh, avenue. Yeah, I, I it's quite right. I, I, I can't disagree. I, I, one very interesting point I've had made to me is that if you look at um, Le Pen's <clears throat> current economic platform, uh, you know, she has once got to the second round and her dad's once got to the second round. So they, they've been you know, the, the hard right in France has been knocking on the door for a generation. Her economic platform is different from previous ones in that it is actually much more Bernie Sanders than Donald Trump or Nigel Farage in in, um, in, uh, in Britain. There, there, there is much more uh, preparedness to use the state uh, and to get aggressive about, about spending, which would obviously put extreme pressure on their uh, on the uh, on the the whole structure of the EU, uh, I mean, it's still. I mean, it's it, it it is like an odd flashback to 2016. On balance, Hillary Clinton did seem more likely to win than Donald Trump, and um, Remain seemed more likely to, to to win than Leave a few days before those uh, those votes. Uh, and it still does look as though Macron probably can piece things together. But Macron is very Hillary Clinton like in terms of, you know, being impressive, you know, and, and with a great CV, but not really being much liked and not really having a, a platform that excites people. And obviously, there are a lot of similarities between Marine Le Pen and and uh, and Trump, it, it is very easy to imagine that happening. And if it if it does, I think part of the reason it's you know, snuck up on us was because of Ukraine, that, that, that uh, there was an initial belief that Macron was going to benefit the sense of being the wartime president and all the diplomacy he was doing in Ukraine. And it's um, so people were more worried about Ukraine as well. And it's now suddenly arisen as an issue. Um, if she wins, that's going to be a, a very interesting Monday morning in, you know, two, three Mondays from now. Um, um, Generally speaking, that's probably going to be a buying opportunity for French stuff very shortly thereafter. But uh, you, probably, you probably want to be careful about going too close to France or anywhere in Europe until until the, until the second round is, is over. But you raise a good point, which is we've been so focused on the war in Ukraine that what are we ignoring? Right. Mm. And, and that, that the driving issues when it comes to politics are consumer prices. Yes. the cost of living. And that's what you saw from Marine Le Pen's rise yeah. uh, well beyond what people had expected. And frankly, yeah. that's what you're seeing when it comes to uh, what's going on over in China and the lockdowns that are ensuing as a result of COVID, which is still happening evidently, even though we've yes. all seemed to have moved on. And that that's leading oil prices mm. to come down. Remember, we were talking about such high oil prices, they were surging to the moon. They're back to where they were at the start, right yes. before the invasion of Ukraine. And it's not for the right reasons. It's because we are seeing mm. the potential slowdown in growth from China. It's because of the potential mm. more hawkish position from central banks that will slow growth. So you, know, you take a look at some of these scenarios and it's just, you know, what have we forgotten in the fog of war that's really driving the dynamics right. on the ground? in ways that are highly com complicated and perhaps uh, somewhat removed from the shock that we've all been basically, you know, focusing on more than anything else. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you, you, you're always scared. What am I missing here? What am I missing? Uh, yeah. um, I do think you, know, you started with corporate earnings um, and your know, brokers analysts are certainly not foolproof, but they generally, they're generally not, not done. They're very well well informed. It it does look as though companies still have their pricing power. Uh, the good news that, that 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 tells us something about the like shape and trajectory of the of the months ahead, which is that um, you don't get a recession immediately. You get a yeah. You know, the recession is further along. You're probably going to get inflation you know higher for longer, followed 
further along the pike by a recession and you then have the fascinating job providing you're out of a recession stocks are a great inflation hedge once things start to slow down and they don't have that earnings power stocks are you know terrible just just radioactive um so i think a lot of people are now getting and this is a this is a flashback to the, the dot-com bubble uh there'll be a sense of can i play not just the market the enthusiasm about buying stocks but also the economy how long does this economy go before before it slows down um so that's a, a, a dynamic that has nothing to do with vladimir putin or xi jinping or whoever it's 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 the uh the classic crowd psychology of how is this market going to work itself out and certainly that's been the sort of feeling is music's still going so you might as well dance even if you can't see 25 <laughs> steps down the line i mean really that's been a, one of the main arguments <laughs> that's a 2007 the crash back if I, if there well, was one. 2007 yeah. wasn't the big market crash it was you know back in 2008 so this really it does yeah. raise the question of what are we on the precipice of or are we just simply remembering the past and you know by definition more gloomy uh, than perhaps we ought to be i could talk with you all day yeah. it is uh past our time 